My name is Elisa Bani Assad. I am the acting academic director for CTLT. Um, the normally academic director for CTLT is also here off camera. Um, Christina, I can see you in, in the list of people. So welcome to you too. And we are um, incredibly thrilled to be hosting this discussion around um, this profound way of celebrating excellence in teaching, which is recognizing people for their amazing teaching work. Um, so I want to begin, though, by acknowledging that I am joining you today from the unceded traditional lands of the Musqueam people as located, I'm located on UBC Vancouver campus right now, um, which is on Musqueam uh, traditional territory uh, that is unceded land. And also to acknowledge that we have folks joining us from UBC Okanagan, um, who will be located on the Silks community, um, this the Silks Nation land. And I also invite everybody to reflect on where they are currently joining us from and um, the profound ways in which our location affects our uh, approach to teaching and learning, the way that it inspires us and the opportunities for inspiration. And also to remind us about the continual process of decolonization, of looking at those um, myths around why we do the things we do and that they are good ways of doing things. So just to remind everybody about our joint mission for decolonization um, across this institution. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, so I just wanna also thank everybody for being here from the panel. Um, thank you to Michael Lee, to David Oliver, to Laura Balt, to Moberly Mo Mo Luger, and to Celeste Leander in no particular order, other than the fact that I think that's the presentation order for going over these awards. So thank you all so much. You're all joining because you are recipients of these awards. You're all amazing, excellent um, instructors. You have been recognized as such. We have a lot of unrecognized instructors who are amazing at their jobs, and that is actually why we're here. Um, so I'm really excited that you're here willing to spread the wealth about how we can broaden and deepen the impact of, um, of the recognition around our incredible instructional team here at UBC. Um, so We've already done a couple of, uh, you know, and I want to welcome everybody here. I also want to say, you know, these panelists are um, definitely, uh, you know, wisdom keepers in in these areas. There may be uh, contributors from the room as well who can speak to some of these points. So just want to make sure that everybody feels like this is a really conversational space and that it's not the case that we're going to be going through a series of presentations. This isn't a webinar. Um, this is definitely a conversation. And, um, and we'll be trying to keep up also with the chat. Apologies that I haven't yet been reading out things that are happening in the chat, but um, but we will be keeping up with the chat and and hopefully keeping this a really dynamic space of, of contribution so that people can feel inspired and empowered to put themselves and others forward for uh, recognition in this area. So we're going to go through several, um, several different prizes specifically. This is not the exhaustive list of things that you can put people forward for. Um, but this is kind of the order of events. So we're going to be looking at the Killam Teaching Prize um, with Moberly and David. We're gonna be looking at the West Coast Excellence Prize with Celeste. And I think Christina, you know a lot about that one too. So I think I might uh, rope you into that one. Um, 3M National Teaching Fellow, which is Michael and the D2L Innovation, which is actually a new one for me with Laura. So thank you so much for, um, for all of your insights there. And then we'll we'll have questions and answers. Maybe I think um, Judy. Uh, in terms of process here, we want we are hoping folks can put questions into the chat so that we can kind of keep a log and keep that discussion going. Is that the idea? Okay, yes. amazing. Thank you, thank you. That's great. So now we're going to kind of go through each of the prizes and or awards or whatever you know the word is that encompasses the grouping of these things and. I just kind of do a quick overview of what each of them is so that we can then have a more fulsome discussion. So the Killam Teaching Prize, um, so looking at um, looking at Moberly and David for this one, the Killam Teaching Prize is something that is awarded, I believe, within UBC. 
Um, the criteria is to look at uh, sustained teaching excellence, the ability to motivate students. Um, awards are given out by faculties, I believe. Um, you guys can maybe chime in on this. And something to keep in mind is the deadline. So the nomination deadlines around February, and March. So, um, so do you want to quickly kind of go over the high, the sort of bird's eye view for this, um, Moberly and David? I'm calling on one of you first, Moberly. You're you're at the top of my screen. We have um, you know a couple of quick quick hit questions around this. Uh, can you would you like to speak to either of these points? Uh, sure, I can speak to um, the sort of general arc of the nomination process in arts. I uh, am in the Faculty of Arts um, and I have, well, I won the prize this year, but I also um, sort of led a nomination because I'm the chair of a small program and we put someone forward two years ago. So I sort of saw from both and but it was also very much a process where we worked with staff. So some of the really nitty gritty, we should have had uh, our administrator here to uh, to tell us those. But uh, the nomination process, there's a nomination. Uh, I also I also sort of am having a regular experience because I'm in a very small unit. So I think larger units uh, have committees that decide on who they're going to nominate every year. In our unit, we people wrote in uh, nominations. You could. Uh, um, and there's only a few of us um, and you need a form that's signed by three people and um, that then gets submitted. I actually thought it was January, but maybe it's more like early February. And then uh, at that point, the uh, nominee finds out that they are in fact going forward and they start working on the package um, uh, that then is due about a month or two later. So that's just sort of a kind of very, very high level. I don't know um, the, the, the eligibility, um, is also, uh, any rank, uh, and you need to have been at UBC for three years and you can't have won the prize in those three years, or sorry, you, you, you need, you can't just win it every year, I guess that's what I'd say. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't know, David, do you want to, uh, fill in any, anything? I don't know how different it is in science, sure. um, but yeah, I, I, I have a, from my experience. Arts experience. Yeah, I can comment a little bit from the science angle. Um, so I've been on the committee for six years, two years as a committee member and four years as the chair. Um, so some of my uh, experience is anecdotal and sort of statistically uh, accumulating. So I can comment anecdotally, but it, I'm, I'm getting a sense as to what the, the, the sort of statistics are starting to look like. Um, so in science, uh, the nominations come in from faculty, uh, department heads and I would say 75% come from undergraduate students themselves. Um, Faculty of Science has a Qualtrics survey um, that they put out there for uh, these nominations to come in through. And uh, the, the, nomin the, the person nominating the, uh, the faculty member uh, has to justify uh, their, uh, their nomination in, in a short uh, couple sentences, a little paragraph. So not an extensive uh, justification. Um, and so I'd say about 75% of those come in from, from students. Um, the uh, Similar to arts, you cannot, the criteria for nomination, uh, you can't have won the, the prize in the last three years. Uh, you need to be a science instructor. So um, uh, in, in, our, in our faculty, something like biochemistry falls under medicine. So the, the instructors there are awarded uh, prizes through medicine, for example. And um, you must have taught it uh, within science for the last three years at the time of evaluation. So those are the three eligibility criteria. Um, a couple of comments on, on some of, you know, I, I think Elisa mentioned at the beginning, how, how do we get more people eligible or nominated at least and, and into, the, into the game? Uh, one of the things I've noticed with science is that fourth year instructors, uh, because the students graduate um, and leave UBC um, in around April, May, as graduation rolls through, um, they, they sometimes don't get nominated. So the fourth year instructors, there seems to be a little bit of a, a paucity of some of those nominations. So maybe the faculty could step up there. And then some departments are a little bit more proactive than others. So some departments like chemistry is quite proactive at getting their, their uh, instructors nominated, whereas other departments are less uh, less proactive and they rely on the students. So there is a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, difference there between departments. 
So I'll, I'll stop there, maybe pass back to Elisa. Yeah, can I just ask if, if you can self-nominate? I don't think so. I don't think it's ever, I'm not sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it hasn't happened in my in my tenure as, as chair or committee member, um, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I just, I was just thinking about, you know, sometimes, um, yeah, I just thought it would be a good thing to kind of keep track of, like, you know, do you, if you feel like you've been meritorious in your teaching, are you, are you able to move forward and, um, and put yourself forward in it for certain things? Sometimes you are, sometimes you're not. Um, but, Stephen, do you have a question? I think it would oh, be- Oh, sorry, David, go ahead. I, I think it would be reasonable to ask the department head to put your name forward. Um, I think that would be a totally, a uh, totally reasonable way to to advance your name in, in into the Killam competition, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point or co-opting a colleague or something. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of, of putting it forward through the department head because that also raises to their attention that you have done something that's award worthy. So it's a nice, uh, uh, you know, a nice conversation to have. Um, Steven, do you wanna go ahead? Uh, not a question, uh, just a, a clarifying comment on the Okanagan campus. The Killam Teaching Prize is at a slightly different level. Uh, we only have one for the entire campus, and we've only been offering it since 2018. Uh, so we've actually included specifically in the criteria for the Okanagan campus Killam Teaching Prize, you must have won a prior teaching award or recognition of some kind because it's basically the top prize on our campus. And if you haven't already received some kind of prior recognition, there's no way you're going to be in the running. We've only given five of them away on a campus of 700 faculty. Uh, so so the the nature of sort of the 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 level of achievement that you needed to have that you needed to have met to be to be eligible or in the running for the Kilm on the Okanagan campus is quite a different thing. Mm, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, maybe we could uh, in when we are sort of sharing this re as recording or whatever as a resource later, um, maybe we could put a note about that and update the materials around that, too. That would be really great. Um, OK, great. So I think. Um, Let's let's just keep moving through our sweep of the prizes. We're doing a kind of overview right now. So I'm gonna call on Celeste, um, or I'm going to move on to the West Coast Teaching Excellence Award and Celeste, that's you. Um, so the West Coast Teaching Excellence Award, if you can advance the slide one more time, Judy, and I apologize if I should be the one advancing the slides through some sort of Zoom magic, magicalness. Um, so this one, uh, I, I have only recently learned about through Christina's involvement in it as well. Um, so I'm just going to basically read what's written here. It's uh, about in, in a commitment to enhanced student engagement and learning. Um, again, it looks like it it celebrates a depth of teaching practice and reflection, and um, and also in this case engages with that uh, reconciliation, indigenization, decolonization aspect of teaching and learning. Um, so. Celeste, do you want to, you know, just to speak to some of the points on this slide, including deadlines and things like that? And then there, I think there are a couple of questions on the next slide that are um, more about application packages and how to get those going. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I didn't know, actually know much about this award either. It is fairly new. I think this is that Christina probably knows, but I think this is just the second or third year or something of this award. Um, it is modeled after the National 3M, um, and the application is similar, which I didn't know going into it. Although I haven't actually looked at the 3M application, but um, I've been told that they're that they're pretty similar. Um, so it is a pretty hefty um, package. It's two stages. So the internal UBC one, I think the deadline for that was November, um, and that one's pretty straightforward. And then the full package um, is due in February, and that goes um, via the provost into the BC. Um, Teaching and Learning Council. Mm -hmm. And so um, thinking about uh, what makes a good package for one of these things. I mean, so I didn't ask that about the Killam. I think, you know, uh, actually, we should come back to that about Killam as well. What What is the recipe for success for someone with the Killam prize? But with this one, um, yeah, what were the strengths? What What do you think yeah. put someone um, over the edge? So the, the first part, the internal part, to UBC um, is very straightforward. It's a four page letter. Uh, it was actually really fun for me to write that. It's sort of free form, although there are some criteria. Um, the big package that goes forward from UBC 
um, is mine ended up being larger than my promotion and tenure packages. It's it's really hefty, um, very um, detailed, I would say. And my brain doesn't function like that. So it was actually really challenging for me, um, that, that part of it. So um, there are, for example, there'll be criteria that, you know, you have to write one paragraph on a specific thing. Um, so it's not free form at all. It's very, um, very detailed how they want, how they want it pieced together. Um, mm -hmm. I, because I'm a nonlinear thinker and not detail oriented, I started early on this package because of that. Um, and the first thing I did was flag anything that I couldn't do myself. There are a lot of pieces to the package that um, needed to come from outside sources. So one um, example that turned out to be a lot more difficult than I imagined it would be was to get a blank copy in an appendix. You have to include a blank copy of the student evaluation forms that students fill out, which mm -hmm. seems like a kind of straightforward thing, but it was actually not trivial to get a blank mm -hmm. copy of that. So things like that. So I flagged all the things that um, I needed help with um, and started on those right away. Um, this package includes um, up to six support letters. And I was advised to include all six. I initially had only had, I had four um, initially because the consequence of that is the more support letters you have, the less you can put in for um, teaching artifacts. So I initially had four and I was advised to include um, all six. Christina actually pointed out to me that I didn't have any letters from colleagues I had taught with. Um, so I sort of cheated on that actually, because I had um, four colleagues that I teach with in my department jointly write a letter and they did that together. Okay. That seemed to be okay since it worked. Um, so six support letters, I, I requested those early on. So that kind of thing. And then I just kind of broke it into sections and just slowly um, built built each section mm -hmm. as, I, as I went through. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I know that we're, you know, moving through time, but Killam people and West Coast Teaching Award people, is there like a, and, you know, just for people trying to ideate themselves into the space of applying for one of these, is there something that feels like a winning combination for these prizes? And then I'll ask the same from, from Laura and Michael for the, for the prizes they're going to speak to. Like, is there a classic Killam Award look, a Killam Award winning look, or is there a classic West Coast Teaching Excellence look other than just Celeste, who is sitting here in human <laughs> form winningly? Um, like, is there, is, is, it, is it a certain, like, or is there, are there certain aspects that you feel like the those awarding bodies are really looking for um, that would not having would mean you one probably won't be successful? One thing that I made the decision to do um, is to go for breadth instead of depth. Um, and I think that's generally true for the Killam as well, from what I remember. Um, right. So because there it is space constrained, even though it's a big package, um, I took just the landing page for artifacts. So either the abstract for a, a paper or something, or um, just an overview rather than the depth of an entire thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that I that's one piece that I would suggest for nice for people putting together these packages. Yeah, that's a really good comment. Um, Stephen. Evidence of the impacts. Uh, you know, we've, we've all got a lot of stuff in our teaching dossiers. We can all present a lot of course materials, but you need something to demonstrate that it's having a disproportionate effect. Uh, and, and so, yeah, if you, it, whatever, if you can find that evidence, you should, uh, you know, and that's going to be true for anybody in the ed lead stream who's going up for tenure promotion. That's going to be true for any, any higher award. I think, um, the, the specifically the West Coast teaching excellence, I think that's a bit of a mystery because it's only been running two years. We'd never submitted one before this year. So we really had no idea what they were looking for. Uh, but, but, um, uh, 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 I think a common uh, piece of advice for all these things is include anything you've got that demonstrates that you're having uh, uh, those impacts either on uh, with with your own students or beyond your own classroom. Um, that doesn't have to be, you know, the results of 14 research papers on the outcomes of a study or something, but but something some data that says something other than i thought this was cool and my students are still standing 
um, is probably mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah, that makes sense. Celeste, you unmuted. Do you have something to add? Oh, I was just going to say that I totally agree with that. I had um, most of my support letters were actually from students. Right. Describing impact that and, 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 it can, and it can be that straightforward. They, you don't, don't take my word for it. Here are three students who loved it as well. Right. Okay. So what? next prize on the list is the 3M National. Oh, sorry. I see David unmuted himself. So maybe he has something oh. to share. Yes. Sorry, David, go. Yeah, I, I was I was just going to briefly comment on the the Killam um, process exactly. at UBC in science per se, uh, it, in particular because I think each faculty has slightly different approaches. But in science, we um, we of course we 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 have a diverse um, teaching coming across multi from different departments, and so when we evaluate forty different nominees, um, we tend to lead well. We do lead with classroom observations. And so the committee um, visits two or three classrooms, um, collects observations, and then goes to the package uh, subsequently to match it up with the evidence of impact and um, and the teaching evaluations and those sorts of uh, those sorts of pieces of evidence. So uh, in terms of the, uh, I, I guess that's the advantage of having an award that's on campus uh, that we can visit classrooms uh, that we do uh, lead with classroom observation. Nice. Yeah. And that in-class piece is really important in that Killam adjudication as well. I think that it's very classroom, or at least for science, which is what I've been involved with. Um, okay. Thanks, David. That was that was really great. Um, okay. So uh, next up is the 3M National Teaching Fellow um, Prize, which, you know, it's interesting to hear that the West Coast Teaching Award Prize is sort of similar in scale in terms of application. And so, Michael, it'll be really interesting to hear um from you about about I'm the kind scale of, of that up, actually <laughs> I don't know that it is I've just been told that but I haven't actually it looked. felt like that <laughs> <laughs> okay um so the 3M National Teaching Fellow Prize is um and I didn't actually know this this is new information to me as well and I need to like educate myself well, this is me educating myself on all these prizes but the STLHE and 3M Canada uh, I guess came together to recognize um very top tier teaching and it's um it's very very seldom award like or not seldom or is very it's very elite like it's only 10 are awarded each year um it goes through the provost office it's another one of these centralized processes where you don't send in your application process directly to the grant to the awarding body um and it looks at educational leadership teaching excellence and innovation in education um so uh, Michael, do you want to talk about the process of applying and and you know what you think it takes to become a three M fellow? I mean, this is a very, very impressive, impressive accomplishment. Thank you for um, for the opportunity to share my two cents. I'm so glad that I'm speaking after David and Kalisa. <laughs> uh, so actually, I can piggyback on what you've been saying and Mobley as well <laughs> um, that you've been saying earlier. Um, this is a very challenging task to put together the whole dossier for the application. However, at the same time, I'm very, very thankful and grateful for the huge support that I received from the administrative folks, as well as from UBC overall. Um, I, I have a very casual conversation with Simon Bate before he started his sabbatical. And I was told, actually, UBC is proudly one of the very few institutions around the whole country receiving many, many 3M awards. So that speaks volume to the high caliber of our education leadership faculty. So it should be a very kind of, uh, prestigious status for the whole university. Um, but back to the questions. Um, yes, it is a hefty process to try to put together application. Uh, as well as Calista, you've been saying, um, there's even more demanding putting a PNT package. Um, you can brand whatever you want to brag and highlight whatever you want to highlight and put the stories in your PNT package. But in your 3M application, you have to be very mindful of they only allow you 30 pages. And that's it. So you have to be very mindful of what do I want to say? What are things that will be redundant? What are things that doesn't need to be there? and how can really shine on things that I really want the review committee to know about. One lesson I learned through the process is, think it through thoroughly 
and decide what story you want to tell your audience. What is the most impressive story that you're going to say? I'm sure many of us have many, many outstanding work that we have done already. They're worth like presenting. But pick and choose the most shining points that you want to shine on. Make sure that is a very unique and impressive story that the review committee will say, whoa, this is interesting. I really want to read on. And then the more they read on, they say, whoa, this is impressive. Ah, I really want to know more about, should I go to the website? Ah, this is the worthwhile candidate. So let's kind of put this one out. That's what you should be doing. So you need to do a lot of like brain searching. Look for like, what's the really important message I want to bring out? Likewise, for your, for your level of support as well, similar to the West Coast application, you, you can have a maximum six letters. To this point, you have very advice. You have like multiple people writing the same letter. <laughs> That's a very good approach. Likewise, I mean, you want to make sure that you have a comprehensive view on everything. I have a letter from my colleagues. I have a letter from my previous peer reviewer. I have a letter from students. Um, I have another letter from my teaching team partners mm -hmm. who sit <laughs> next to me right now. Um, and I also have a letter from the administrator as well. So you want to make sure that you have like a very comprehensive viewpoint to justify it and to speak to things that you cannot really speak about in your, in your dossier. Mm -hmm. They are the people who give you lots of evidence to what you claimed earlier, yet you don't have enough space to expand. So instead of expanding on like how my peer reviewer been reviewing my, my teaching, I let the peer reviewers write it on the letter. Likewise, instead of me bragging about like student's impression and about like the student learning experience, I invite the student to speak about it. So you need to be very, very mindful of how much room you have or how little room you have actually, and to be mm -hmm. very concise and focused. Mm -hmm. That being said, I have to say, Nifal, I mean, I'm very grateful to the whole support team getting that all together. Um, mm -hmm. Try to collate everything, doing everything, and make sure it flows well. It's another piece of art as well. As long as it flows really well smoothly, a strong story, that's all that you need to have. Yeah, that's really amazing. Both you and Celeste mentioned about the amount of support that you received in preparing these huge information packages and being able to draw together um, all of these materials. Um, and I also heard about some sort of, uh, just hearing about some sequencing from Stephen as well around when you're even eligible to really apply for these awards. So Moberly, you mentioned anybody who's been teaching for three years or who's been around for three years at UBC, uh, Moberly and David about the kill I'm teaching, anybody can apply. This can be your first teaching award, right? Like you can have received no awards before, not even departmental awards, no commendations at all. You can get a kill em. Is that true for the West Coast Teaching and 3M? Um, for the West Coast Teaching, you have to have had a KLM previously. Um, I feel like there were requirements around teaching length, but I can't remember. Christina, do you remember? That Sorry, one? I'm just looking it up. <laughs> um, I don't know that you have to have had a, a teaching award previously, but you know, it, it doesn't hurt. I'm just skimming the requirements um, for the BC Teaching and Learning Council. Uh, you West have to have had a KLM, I know, but I think that's the only award and that, that might be uh, an internal UBC piece. Uh, I can't Michael, remember. do you know about for 3M while yeah. Christine is doing homework? <laughs> Actually, I, maybe I can tag on to like the earlier conversation. Christine, I do not recall I do the West Coast not. request any prior hmm. awards. Mm -hmm. As long as the candidate really shine well, in particular, I think it's about the indigeneity as well as decolonization. That is one of the very important piece that focus mm -hmm. on for the West Coast. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder but for 3M, is there a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Laura, yeah. I was gonna say, I wonder if it was your department, maybe, maybe it's like different departments might have different requirements or faculty. I don't know, I'm looking right now. Yeah, it's worth it for us to chase that down so that we can be really clear in our communications around, about this. Uh, um, um, just to make sure, because we want to make people aware of when they are eligible for stuff and when they're not. <laughs> um, 
And for 3M, is there, a, is there a requirement or is it strongly encouraged that you already have a, an ex another teaching award? Uh, no, actually 3M doesn't require that. Um, instead, actually they encourage um, people at their slightly earlier stage of the career yeah. life mm. start applying for it. Um, they emphasize that this is not a life, country, a life achievement award. Rather, this is mm. like you've been shining well and there's a promising career that you continue to shine well. Mm. And honestly, I'm very surprised that they would choose me as an old fart to come to this award ceremony. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, I mean, they actually focus on like raising up like younger people and really kind of profile them and give them opportunity to shine further well down the road in the future as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's, that's fantastic. I want to go now to Laura and the uh, D2L um, innovation and teach uh, innovation award in teaching and learning, not innovation award in teaching and learning. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this one's really interesting to me because it's about specifically about innovation um, and sort of transformative approaches to teaching and learning. So it's looking. So they seem to have their each their kind of wheelhouse in terms of what they are specializing in. So I guess when considering which award to put yourself forward for to to ask your colleague to put your you forward for this would be a consideration, right? Um, so I, I, th again, this looks like a very elite award. Only five are awarded per year. Congratulations to all of those who get them. That's amazing. And uh, and Laura, you're able to share your experience and how it's, what does this application process look like and who is eligible and who should put themselves forward? Who would you encourage? Oh, um, that's a good question. I would have to look again at the website because it's been a little while. Um, but I think something that's really helpful about this one is that it is so focused. So as Michael Lee uh, talked about, it's it's helpful to tell a focused story in all these different applications. Um, and with this one, you, you kind of have to um, because it's about one innovation and the impact that it had. Um, so I think if there is like one innovation that has been particularly impactful, um, I encourage people to consider applying. Um, and I think uh, something that was helpful for us is that it, we're a team who came to design and delivered this innovation. Actually, Michael Lee was part of the um, starting of this um theatrical endeavor. Um, and so I think drawing on the team was really helpful. Uh, we also had a lot of nomination letters or support letters. And the um, one of the unique things about the innovation that we had is it wasn't just about students. Uh, there, was a, there were many learners um, coming from different sectors. Uh, so we were able to draw on on learners um, from a variety of perspectives, which was also helpful. Um, something about this innovation is also that we uh, built and changed it uh, over years. We're still doing it. We're, we're performing it next week, and it's a whole new version that we've never done before. So um, based on, on learner feedback and the needs in particular contexts, we were able to show how we it, it evolved and changed and continued to have impact. Um, as was alluded to before as well, showing the impact is really important. Mm. Um, and so those like quotations that gave me goosebumps when I first read them on our feedback forms, like those kinds of things were, I think, really powerful and helpful. Not necessarily to put in our portion of the um, package, but to ask uh, some of our nominators or support letter people to put those quotations in and that kind of thing. So I think, um, and as as has been said, like uh, drawing on our fantastic staff and and colleagues, um, faculty colleagues, uh, is really important and, and helpful. Um, and then I think. For this one, giving um, giving a taste, but like the the tastiest bite of the dish that makes people go, oh, I want to want to have more, um, is was really helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. And then providing links 
so that they, they can experience more or learn more about mm -hmm. it. Um, those are some of my thoughts. I uh, was saying earlier to my colleague, I'm glad everyone else goes first because then I can just say, oh yeah, ditto. <laughs> I agree with what you said um, and, and just build on it. Yeah, amazing. I think, yeah, it, there are some definite themes forming. It sounds like um, with all of the awards, it seems like there's, you know, a kind of identity of the educator that really comes through and that having that narrative and that personality really shine through so that a reviewer can almost latch on and, and imagine the whole person behind the application. It feels like that's a that's a really important component of crafting these nominations. Um, it, different a little bit from maybe the Killam because actually the Killam, the, the nominated person does some work, but it's nothing like the amount of work that goes into this sort of dossier that's described in these more multi-phase um, awards. And just to clarify for the D2L, is that also something that goes through the provost office? Is it something that you need um, or can you put yourself directly forward to it? Judy, you, you're the expert here. How does that one work? No, I don't think we have an internal process here at UBC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So if people are interested in applying for this one, they can just do it. That's yes. great. Fantastic. Um, okay, so those are our um, all of our you know, main points that we wanted to hit on about each of these awards. Um, I wanted, you know, I have a couple of general questions that I have, but I'd like to open it up for questions to the room um, or any comments or things that have sprung to mind for anybody while folks were going over these awards. Oops. And like we said, you can you can put some things in chat or just, you know, unmute Oliver. Uh, sorry, David, David Oliver, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Just, just a quick comment related to um, teaching innovation and the Killam Awards, because the Killam Awards in science lead through classroom observations, and then we work back back to the documentation um, as a committee in adjudication. Um, one of the things that's happening as teaching modes change, hybrid teaching, online teaching, laboratory teaching, the committee is always looking for ways to make sure that we recognize these new forms of teaching. And so um, if the if the nominee does a good job of, of uh of presenting that work in alternative forms, it makes it easier for the committee to recognize their their uh, innovation. And so historically, it's been lecture based teaching that Killam Awards have observed. Um, but we've gotten out in the last few years to like get good looks at lab teaching. Um, but hybrid teaching and, and online teaching, we need to do uh, more. It, it came with the pandemic a little bit. But um, the nominee uh, is it's in their best interest to make sure that if they're doing a good job of that, that they've highlighted themselves uh, effectively. Uh, I don't know if people I think Michael might have alluded to the idea of having a website that was linked to the 3M package. I don't know if that was my, what Michael was suggesting, but I'm just wondering if people have used those sorts of tools to expand their uh, their packages. They're kind of delivering that. Oh, we did. This is Laura speaking. Um, so the Alone in the Ring team, like I said, giving we gave a taste of the innovation and then provided a link to where they can find more stuff, stuff online. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good point, um, David. Actually, um, the, the application package does allow you to hyperlink to a website. However, they do not go pages because once when you kind of create a web page or link to a web page, they count as part of your dossier pages. Um, I can't remember offhand as to how many pages they locked you off. So you need to be very mindful as to what you put in if you're creating a web page and what you put into your dossier as well. Um, mm. But yeah. I was just gonna add oh, really? as well, uh, in arts, uh, we don't, no one comes to see your teaching. That's not something they do um, sort of as an official part of the process, but kind of like, you know, getting four letter writers sneaking into one letter. Uh, I had some of my, uh, I had, uh, you know, you, you're sort of as a candidate, you're at arm's length, um, but I had my head say, you know, someone wants to come and see your teaching. And it was someone, you know, who we who was writing a letter for me. So they were able to kind of do a very recent observation and put that in the letter. 
Um, so that kind of kind of bulks up the the letters and the and the package. Um, and it all is based on the the dossier and the nominator letter. There's no other way to um, yeah, you're not showcasing it in that uh, in, through the the live the live classroom like like David was saying. Mm -hmm. I have so speaking of of those kinds of things, um, have lecture recordings started sneaking into this space at all? I mean, this was something that didn't happen at all a few years ago, and now we all have tens of hours of ourselves giving lectures. Um, is that is there a place for a particular like a favorite lecture somewhere in your dossier, or is it is it not really a thing? It's we've used it with the Killam Science Killam Awards um, in the final stages when we get down to the top top ten. If we can get a couple of videos that the entire committee can watch all of the videos, it's really helpful. So we we get out to to live classrooms, but the videos are helpful at the end of the process for us. How about for the other ones? Do those uh, and in those larger dossiers, do they can you link to a video or is it not helpful? So part of the, this is going to be sort of a no answer answer, but um, technically in the in the application page for the West Coast Teaching Award, um, they state that you cannot list links. Hmm. However, um, they do a meeting of the previous award winners where you can ask questions and someone there who had won the previous year said that he did put links in there. Um, and from my packet, from the feedback I got on my package, I know I did not put links in there, but as I'd mentioned before, I put sort of landing pages mm -hmm, of things mm -hmm. that are online. And I know that at least some of them did go to those on their own, um, mm -hmm. though we technically were not supposed to put links in. So I didn't put links in, but I know that from the specific feedback that I got that at least some of the, um, the folks did go and look them up themselves. Mm hmm. Right. Um, so there were, there seem to be, you know, awardees in at different stages of um, of, of development in their teaching practice. Um, if a new faculty member who's, you know, sort of trying to build up a tenure package, I you know, there's nothing more um, secure making than having a teach a big teaching award in your tenure package. Um, what would you advise them around how to move forward? Like, would you would you say go for the three M at once? Newer people now, or would you say start with the kill them? Or what would you what would you say? This kind of to anybody who wants to unmute, um, including anyone in the room who knows about these things. <laughs> but I'll call on somebody if they don't know. So I don't. Uh, so maybe Moberly, if have you had to mentor or had the opportunity to mentor junior faculty, and what would you tell somebody if they came to you and said, "What should I do?" Well, I am pre tenure, and I'm basically mm -hmm. just super grateful to my <laughs> the director of my unit put me up this year, so I could get it into my uh, package, which I just submitted uh, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Congratulations! Uh, so I don't know if I'm the best person. I mean, I as I am a program chair, um, but we are. We are a very small unit, and um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I think that it, I don't think that, um, yeah, I, I would just, I would just encourage. I think the idea of uh, of talking. I think the reality is that even though there are formal nomination processes, there's also a lot of chit chat about the kill and you know, I who's going to go and talk to this person. So you know, if you can have some of those conversations and advocate for yourself in that informal context, then yeah good <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's not a very helpful answer but oh we have a great question in the chat what about the relative importance of graduate versus undergraduate teaching um for maybe each of the awards maybe we could go around the table i can speak see. to that quickly because i do uh no graduate teaching in my position i primarily teach in first year and mm -hmm. that was fine yeah and david for science I think it's out of bounds, graduate teaching, right, for Killam? Uh, we, we, do, we, do observe, we do observe some graduate teaching, but it's, I don't, we've never had a winner that hasn't taught any undergraduate courses um, during winter session. 
So um, we we do we do um, observe the graduate classes, but they tend to be quite small, and uh, mm -hmm. and which is which is interesting because you get to see seminar style classrooms. But typically, those instructors teach larger undergraduate classes in different settings as well. So they we see it in both in both uh, contexts. Yeah. Hmm. Stephen, what about for your the, the sort of UBCO awards? Um, what's the what's the mix there? Yeah, th th there's two major campus awards. Uh, one's the award for teaching excellence and innovation, and mm -hmm. that usually goes to two people a year. And then and then there's the Killam. Uh, some faculties have their own uh, uh, teaching awards with a varying degree of formalism in terms of, of what that process looks like um so so I, the first thing is is i think be aware of what is out there and what and what you're eligible for your department might have teaching awards your faculty might have teaching awards and then and then you could be thinking about campus level stuff uh and then of course we've all got our own academic societies in our own disciplines uh, and and so, for example, you know, the, the Chemical Institute of Canada has has two teaching awards, one of which is specifically for early career faculty. So um, mm -hmm. uh, get, get a sense of the landscape of of what's out there, what's available. Uh, I, I think if you are somebody that's won a teaching award, it's probably because you have a over surplus of empathy and you're willing to help other people cold call those people and say, can I look at your nomination package? Cause I think I'm, I want to go up for this in two years. It, it, a, a big part of, of what can be a struggle and a frustration is if you have no idea what a winning package looks like, you don't know what you're, what you're trying to, what you're trying to craft in terms of the narrative or the type of information that's there. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, people who are around who have won these things and, and, um, I, I, I think, I think probably those people would be happy to send you whatever documents they've got. It's just like, well, this is what we're for me. Uh, uh, and, and, and don't be afraid to ask, to, to ask those questions. Um, I, I think, you know, formally or informally, I think there probably is, a, at least a perception of a progression. And, and, you know, if, if, if your department has 20 people and they have one award, that's probably an easier thing to look at first than, six awards at the faculty level or 10 awards at the national level, right? And and at each of those stages, if you can check some boxes and say, well, somebody thought I was good at this, somebody thought that this was already award worthy, um, then that helps the next application. And and so, yeah, there's nothing, that, there's nothing that says you can't just swing for the fences and, and go for the 3M and, it, you know, when you're pre-tenured. But I would, I would think the odds of that would be pretty low. And, oh, my God, it's a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and really all, all of these things are not, are, are not zero work, but the flip side of that is that it's, it's work well spent. Cause this is all, this is all stuff that's going to go in your teaching dossier anyway. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've found whenever I've gone up for an award, it's been an opportunity for me to look at my teaching philosophy statement and go, Oh God, I was an idiot four years ago. That's all wrong. I'm going to burn this to the ground. I'm going to start over with it. it so it, it, it keeps it keeps your educational portfolio up to date and and putting that time and energy into crafting these documents sort of forces you to reflect on stuff that you might not otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I think, I think look around and sort of mentally, you know, like this one and then this one and then this one uh, and mm -hmm. ask others who will want it for their advice and, and to look at their documentation. Yeah, for sure. Are all of you nodding because you are willing to share your application packages with everybody. <laughs> um, I think that's a, it's a really good point. I mean, that's how we all work in terms of, you know, we all read papers before we write a paper. We, most of us are looking at tenure and promotion documentation before we apply for those. And I think going in blind to one of these awards, especially those big ones, seems like a, you know, just a time sink. I mean, you just, you, it won't be successful. I think they're, is definitely an art to writing these kinds of applications and actually um, getting those forward. Some applications are actually more work for the nominator. Uh, so I was recently nominated for, uh, you know, a computer science award and I did nothing. And this poor person who was nominating, <laughs> you know, shout out to Reed for the tens of hours he spent pulling all this together. Or maybe I was supposed to be doing it, but he saved it. 
saved me from doing it. I'm not sure that now I feel bad. Um, but yeah, so all of these are a lot of work, right? Oh, and Ju but Judy, you wanted to mention about the West Coast support options. Yes, so um, it's a lot of work and um, West Coast is 20 pages. Um, 3M is 30 pages. D2L, because it's a team collaborative teaching, so it will involve a whole team and many drafts. So before you start, you may also want to get in touch with the communication person in your faculty and as they offer a fresh look. Um, sometimes we, we love our teaching and we start talking so much about one area, but it may get a little bit boring for a lay person. So um, having someone in the communication department or area to help you will be useful. So I'm also the um, CTLT support person on um, the West Coast 3M um, award. So for those of you who is looking into submitting the four page um, internal letter, um, contact me. I'm happy to help you review your letter. The 3M, the deadline is coming up. We only have like two and a half months to prepare that maybe for next year. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to say that usually for many 3M fellow recipients, it often takes them more than one try. I know that mm -hmm. one, one person from UBC actually tried three times. So please, um, they, they sometimes get, give you very good feedback to help you improve your, your letter. Um, for the D2L, I've been on the adjudication committee for a few years. So I've been wanting to see more UBC teams. Please, I, please. UBC team, we need to get together. We need to get, try to get three, four, five nomination because some university, they have a machine going, yes. Hmm. So it's really good to know. Yes, that is actually really good to know. We should probably, you know, keep talking all of us and try and get a get a bit of a nominations business going. I think, um, you know, my home department computer science has a has a committee that just talks about awards and all the awards we should all be nominating ourselves for all the time. Um, I don't know that that's present in every department, so it might not be. And it, so, you know, David, you mentioned that some departments are much more proactive about getting people's names out there and there's a lot of talent that's being not recognized and celebrated because not every department has those kinds of things um i was so moberly yeah go ahead i was just going to sneak in a thought that i was going to mention earlier um about this idea of you know looking at examples uh when i was leading the nomination for my colleague that was something i worked with the letter writers on um, because I think often mm -hmm. these things are really built on letters, particularly by undergraduates who don't know how to write these letters or haven't seen them so much before. And we're really grateful for the help. So I said, I, I sent examples and I said, you know, I can look at it with you. And, and a lot of them took me up on it and it did add the nominator work uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. that that's really uh, another dimension is like all the people that are working on it, giving them that that precedent of like what is this kind of what does this genre look like um that was something that i think uh, yeah was was helpful mm -hmm. thank you that's yeah i think that's a really that's a nice natural way to bring in that uh collaboration and expertise as well so that's that's really great um i also wanted to double back to that apply multiple times i've gone up for teaching awards and not gotten them it is depressing i think you know there is a certain you feel a bit like, oh, <laughs> there's a sadness when you don't don't get something that you applied for. Have, have any of you had that experience? And what would you say to people who, um, you know, who who are facing this and maybe are a bit risk averse about not feeling rejected? David, go for it. Oh, I... Sorry, you were unmuted, so I thought that I was... Unmuted, but I, I will comment on it. I mean, in, in the Killam the Kill competition... Um, there's a lot of nominees each year, so so 25 to, to 35 probably in science alone. And so not everybody's going to win the top five awards. Um, but we rank everybody on a good, great wow scale as we're going through the observations because everybody is excellent. Uh, you know, they're they're really strong uh, and and exciting teachers to watch and and very interesting. And I and I think 
you know, the Killam Awards, I, I'm, it's a lot of time to adjudicate these. And I do it because I think it's great for our students to have our, our instructors focused on quality teaching each year and enhancing their teaching um, each year. And I can see my colleagues in the department when they're nominated, they're focused and they're, and they're really working on their craft for the, for the full season. Um, so I think there's good reasons to do it other than winning. Um, and I think it benefits the whole institution and our students, uh, you know, to, to the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I do, um, I do think it's worth it to remember for faculty that, that you might not be successful, but that, um, but that you can try again and that you should try again. And as you said, David, like getting into the top five, I think, you know, with, there's sort of, so my perception has always been it's kind of a cloud of really excellent, excellent people that are all wows. And then um, and then it's like a, it a moment of almost random choice at the very end where it's like, oh, I guess these five wows. <laughs> and then, then you'll notice that the, some of the five that, or some of the few that didn't get named one year end up being the ones named the subsequent year because you're like, yeah, we needed more more tokens than that for these amazing people. Um, I think if you only put yourself up once, then you, it's statistically likely that you won't be, that you won't, that it won't be your turn, even though it should be your turn and it should be everybody's turn who's, who's uh, doing this excellent work. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, but in terms of that, sort of, I think one of the things that, you know, when Judy and I were talking about this session and Judy, I just wanted to take a minute and say, thank you so much for putting this together. And, it's, you know, this sort of very, carefully thought out session and, and really amazing people here. Um, you know, you had said that you wanted to help people frame how much work it was to do these nominations. Um, and, but also you, you had an interesting question, which was how do, how does one kind of plan for success? And, you know, Celeste and uh, others have already touched on, like you want to embody yourself into these documents and um, make sure that you're really putting yourself forward well. But I think there's, um, you know, so, so far I've heard, you know, make sure that you have good examples of your work, make sure that your impact is, is really well characterized in your nomination package. Um, you know, Michael, you mentioned telling an, the, an excellent story that people can really dive into and Laura as well, just make people really, really engaged. Um, so are there any other, other thoughts around, like, if somebody's asking, am I someone who could apply for one of these how would they know to feel the confidence to have all of these things? I think people are often quite humble. They might not necessarily see themselves in your amazing stories. Um, Celeste, do you want to speak to that? Uh, I would say my first reaction to that is to really ask for help and have people look over your um, package, uh, especially me knowing that I'm going to, I for sure was going to miss details in the criteria because that's not how I work. Mm -hmm. um, and so thank you to Christina and Judy who, both looked over my package more than once and caught things that I had not um, touched on or had suggestions that were really helpful. Um, so especially with the bigger packages, I would say don't try to do it in a silo, like definitely ask for people to um, to go over go over the criteria and sort of match your documents and and have and have suggestions for you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, once I was doing a, a kill em observation and the person I was observing said, oh no, I didn't do any active learning today. Um, and <laughs> and they did end up, end up winning <laughs> one of the awards that year. I think there are some things that people imagine you have to be doing to mm -hmm. be eligible. Um, is that the case? Are there some things that could write you off as not being somebody who should even bother applying for these awards or is it really very open? What do you think about that, the narrowness of the criteria? Maybe Laura and Michael, or, or yeah, Judy, go for it. So some of the um, D2L award that I adjudicated in the past, we the committee really looked into the impact. So mm -hmm. gathering information, um, quotation from students, from your know, community partners, from everyone. Like, And then they also wanted to see a long-term impact. So they do want, not just this year, but what about the student from three years ago? So they mm. really, um, so start gathering your evidence and impact. And and yeah, so it's something that we look at in the adjudication committee. Mm. 
And we also um, have a question. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Yeah, I was. Uh, thanks, Judy. Sorry. Do you want me to read? I can read it, or do, were you yes. going to read it? I can. I can read it. Okay. So, um, this is actually a great question. Um, how do students know about these awards? How does? I mean, this is a really good point, actually. David, you spoke to this that fourth year students often have like it's drifted past them, and then they're out the door. They're not nominating anybody. So, how do students find out about these awards, such that they can then nominate the instructors, such that we can drive that nomination? Um, should someone initiate the nomination on behalf of the instructor? Um, We've mentioned that if someone wants to self-nominate, they can co-opt somebody into doing it or talk to their head of department. But um, but yeah, what are these pathways? How does how does one get nominated for um, for each of these awards? Who who does the who starts this process? So for Killam students and and others colleagues, Celeste, do you know Celeste, Michael, Laura? Do you guys know who nominated you and what their role was? I got a message from the dean's office encouraging me to apply, um, and that's the first mm -hmm. I even ever heard of this award. Mm -hmm. But um, so yeah, that sounds more like a self nomination. nomination. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, the official nomination comes from the provost that writes a I letter see. and submits the. Oh, the I see. I see. Yeah. And so you apply to the provost to say, "Hey, I'm. I'd like to put myself up for this," and then the provost office does the official nomination and sends the package in. Christina, you have a wise hand up do you can you speak to this that's fine um yeah so anyway the way it's been happening at ABC Vancouver the last couple of years is is there's a call that goes out and I think this Celeste this is how it came to you um I think to deans and associate deans and I'm not sure where else uh saying anybody who's interested so this is the self-nomination mm -hmm. part anybody who's interested here's the process for for applying for the internal process and then there's a committee that selects um two people because you can only have two from each institutions for the west coast sorry mm -hmm. um and then the people put together their nomination packages and the provost writes a letter uh, that's the sort of official nomination mm -hmm. and then for the d2l how and 3m how do those ones work d2l you go ahead, Laura. No. No, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Laura, go ahead. I was gonna say, I'm not sure I totally remember. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure Michael Lee shouted over to the office the next door, hey Tal, maybe you should <laughs> apply for the D2L with the Alone in the Ring team. Um, and we met and we thought, oh yeah, this this could be good. Um, and so I think it it, it yeah, I think that's how it happened for us. And we got a lot of support from people writing letters from the dean over there and the chair over there and someone from an external organization and students and other learners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I can add on to what Laura been saying, I think one of the biggest advantage for working at UBC at least is that we tend to be a very collegial team in here. So, I mean, quite true, actually, I was shouting at one of my colleagues saying, hey, you should be nominated for that one. Should I nominate you? And then she should say, no, I will self-nominate myself. That's okay. <laughs> and then a few months after, we should turn around and say, hey, Michael Lee, should I nominate you for another award? <laughs> and that's how all these things happen. Um, so to right. answer the questions, I think it's oftentimes it, um, it either like your department head or someone kind of in the leadership position or someone kind of next door to you kind of naturally say, hey, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. Then we're, take that path off. <laughs> we're working on one right now that like I saw it and I was like, oh, this, uh, this name of colleague, we should nominate them. And and kind of I'm, I'm quite junior in my role. And so I asked some people who have been around a bit longer, um, how does this work? And they said, oh, well, we should ask her <laughs> because she's going to have to do a lot of work um, right. to, to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, I think that that sort of collegial nomination thing, I think that's a, that's a really wonderful avenue. Um, in terms of students, I feel like what I'm hearing from the room is that students often don't know to do it. And sometimes you have an upstart student who does know to do it, but it's rare. Um, that's what I've noticed. I, my, my personal concern also with waiting for students to nominate 
or even with waiting for someone else to nominate you is that there are all kinds of biases around who people think will probably win awards and people who should really be nominated for awards but don't necessarily look traditional in their roles don't necessarily get nominated as aggressively. So if you're thinking about, if you're here as a person who's thinking about nominating others, I would I would look at, you know, colleagues of color, um, you know, of, of uh, non-binary gender or, you know, just people who are not the typical person who sits in those roles. Um, because, yeah, I think I, I personally started an initiative of nominating um, people of color and, and women for certain computer science awards and they, they all win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every single time I've had 100% hit rate for all my nominees. Um, it's just they're not there. And uh, these are for awards that nobody, had, no woman had won in years or really mm -hmm. ever. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I think it's important to keep that in mind when um, thinking through who to nominate. And also, if you're someone who is diverse in some way or non-traditional in some way, um, not seeing a recipient who looks like you, I mean, that is kind of the, the experience of somebody who is different in a situation, but that's okay. It doesn't mean that you can't be the first person who looks like you to win this award. Um, and and the, and actually when people are looking at these accomplishments, all of that falls away. And so it's really just about getting the nomination in. It's And then uh, your excellence will shine through. So, um, I, I so yeah. I have a little thought in here. Um, in, yeah, in Michael, go for it. Thinking back in my, in, in my previous nominations, I actually have been very mindful of not including or not asking my current student to write my letter of support. Um, mm -hmm. as, I mean, I personally feel like in fact that could be a potential conflict of interest. And I intentionally make sure that I am keeping an arm's length for any of my nomination. Um, so mm -hmm. even if I were approaching my students per se, I mean, I tend to approach my former student who graduated mm -hmm. already. Um, to make sure that I'm, I do not have any influence on them or they, like whatever, the comfort, potential conflict of interest. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. I think um, sometimes those relationship lines, when you have such great relationships that you've built up with your current students, can get very blurred and you can say, oh, geez, it would be really great if somebody would nominate me for a killer or something. But you're absolutely right that it places, there's of course a power differential while you're currently holding their grade in your hands and uh, and it it presents a very clear conflict of interest around around current students, um, but former students, uh, yeah, Azita, thank you for um, asking this in the chat. I think former students one could go talk to right and say, hey, I need a student letter for this. And Celeste, you mentioned you had student letters. Um, were th those I'm guessing were former students who you were talking to about those kinds of accounts. Yep, former students for support letters. Um, and I think to specifically answer Azita's question, I I think student, former students can nominate you definitely for a killing, but I think they still have to be students enrolled at the institution. Mm -hmm. So previous, took your class previously, they could nominate you the next year. Yeah, that's right. That's why there's a barrier around the fourth year student, because none of your former student, or the fourth year instructor, because none of your students will still be students. <laughs> But, and they have to be to nominate you for the kill. Um, so yeah, so that's a blind spot that I think departments can maybe mitigate that. And also you as a fourth year instructor can mitigate that too by talking to your colleagues um, to help elevate that. I'm mindful of time. We've been, we've been chatting for a while and I think we were slated to end sort of around this time. I hope that people got a lot of useful information out of this session. We're going to be posting this uh, on the CTLT website as a resource for people to, to, to revisit. And we look forward to keeping in touch with everybody in your awards journey. So thanks everybody for joining us. And thank you, Judy, for designing this session. This was really wonderful. Thank you. So and much. all the panelists. Thank thanks you. everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your wise, wise words. Thank it's you been so wonderful. much. Thank you for joining us, you guys. This is great.